Okay, thank you so much, Orly, for this really very nice presentation. And uh, of course, there are uh, some questions for you. As I start with the first one, um, I had a question and it was in carrying out a, a period periodic probing examination and uh, more specifically the measurement of bleeding, how do you overcome the problem of bleeding tracking from one tooth to the other and thereby maybe overestimating the number of bleeding points? And I guess um, uh, this one did not mean that you start in the front, but you start, of course, in the distal part and not in the, in the proral part. But do you know an answer to that? So I think uh, if you look very carefully when you probe and you take out the probe, you can see if it bleeds from uh, this uh, exact point. But if you move uh, further to other uh, teeth and you see blood on them, so you, you should take a gas and try to, uh, to, de to dehydrate this area and to keep it very dry and then to continue uh, with the measurements. But if uh, a person bleeds so badly that it will uh, leak to other, uh, to other uh, sites, so I think uh, anyway he has a, a very high bleeding uh, score. So it, it really doesn't matter if it will be 40 or 45. Uh, it means that he has a very high score of bleeding. So I think uh, as, as a clinician, we will treat them the same. Okay, thank you so much. And um, in the risk assessment tool of Tonetti and Lung, the number of teeth lost we put in should only be the ones lost by periodontal disease, isn't it? This is what you meant. Uh, usually we put, we put all, all the, the teeth that were lost, not always. Uh, we, we, not, we don't always know whether uh, we lost the teeth uh, to periodontitis or not, or to uh, to decay or from some other reason, but uh, right. but we we cannot always know that. So we are putting all the missing tooth teeth, uh, no matter if they were lost uh, because of uh, periodontal reasons or other reasons. Okay, that's clear, I guess. Um, because it's a little bit confusing because of the new uh, classification, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, but so that's why it's it's good that you answered it clearly. Um, can you re-emphasize the clinical parameters expectations in patients with poorly controlled or significant non-modifiable factors when tailoring our initial therapy? Uh, I'm not sure what uh, the question means um to the clinical expectations in a patient when he's poorly controlled so when he has the, the diabetes for instance what okay. uh, are the what do you expect because you i guess this question is because in the beginning you said that there were expect from a pocket from four to six millimeter that it will reduce with one and a half so i think when you have a poorly controlled uh, patient and for instance diabetes what do you expect then clinically? Do you have different uh, okay. uh, expectations? Do you have okay. different so when, so when people are poorly controlled, we can divide it to two sections. First of all, the, the, the patients that are poorly controlled before because of uh, uh, they don't control their oral hygiene habits. So uh, with this patient, we expect uh, a lesser amount of uh, success in this phase and a lesser amount of uh, reduction in probing depth. Also, if a, per a person is a diabetic and uh, he controls his oral hygiene, uh, but his diabetes is not uh, controlled, uh, so probably we will have uh, uh, less uh, success in the reduction of his uh, probing depth. And that's why we should consider using other uh, methods uh, at this stage. Okay, I have another question here is um, how and when to decide between a second cycle of non-surgical therapy and going for surgery? 
So what is your end point of the initial treatment, let's say, and when do you decide to go to surgery right away, or when do you decide to maybe do another uh, non-surgical uh, treatment? Uh, so my decision is uh, based on the on on the pocket on the sides of the pocket. If I have a whole quadrant that has a deep pockets of five millimeters and more, uh, so I will go to surgery. But if I have a quadrant that has only two pockets that are not near one each other of uh, five or six millimeters and more. So I will try to use other methods of uh, of uh, treatment and not to uh, to operate on these two uh, two or one pockets. So if I have isolated uh, pockets, I will rather do the uh, non-surgical treatment again with some uh, adjunctives. Or but if I have a, a whole quadrant that uh, did not. Uh, react very well to this um, stage and has a deep pocket so i will choose to to have a surgery um and as i as you say you will choose to do uh when there is only single pockets let's say a few you do adjunctive and with adjunctive you mean antibiotics in that case um I will not use antibiotics in the reevaluation. I will choose to use maybe uh, local antimicrobials. But uh, if I will uh, suspect that the patient uh, will not react well and he's uh, in the criteria of uh, giving anti antibiotics, so I will combine systemic antibiotics in the uh, in the non-surgical treatment. Yes but right on the start. Okay, right, because that's also a question when you uh, decide to add antibiotics to your initial treatment, when do you want to give it and what will be the criteria to give it and uh, what will be the dose? Okay, so I think I went through it uh, during my presentation, but I will go over it again. Uh, I personally you, uh, try not to use uh, systemic antibiotics because I really feel uh, uh, that we have a problem with it in, in, in the concert of the resistance strain. But uh, I will give it uh, to people with periodontitis uh, grade C. I will give it to people who smokes or has uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, and the protocol is... Uh, uh, 500 milligrams uh, of uh, amoxicycline three times a day for seven to ten days with uh, uh, two, uh, 250 milligram of uh, metronidazole three times a day for the the same amount of days so one pill from this and one pill from this three times a day for uh, seven to ten days Okay, and, and when will you administer it? I guess at the end of your initial treatment, but probably also the oral hygiene of the patient need to be uh, at least below 20%, or do you have any criteria for that? Uh, I will give it in the end of the phase, in the last appointment, uh, when I know that uh, the patient already controlled his uh, oral hygiene. And uh, when we finish, all the appointments of the non-surgical uh, periodontal treatment, uh, then uh, I will give the antibiotic uh, protocol. Okay, and another question um, I saw uh, in one of your slides also infection. In the, in the Netherlands, we, we talk about inflammation and the immune response of the, the patients. And if you, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, you say you have your personalized medicine. So I, I mm -hmm. guess that in the beginning, when you do your uh, examination and your diagnosis, is there uh, with you, or do you think that you need to address some issues in the lifestyle, like the stress or nutrition or things like that? So first of all, uh, our goal is first of all to to persuade people uh, to stop smoking. This is the first thing that we must do. 
yeah. and, and we should do it very vigorously and uh, not just to speak about it one time at the clinic. This is very important uh, for uh, our success and the patient's success. And also, uh, we know now that uh, periodontitis is uh, connected to many other lifestyle uh, areas like uh, nutrition, like uh, uh, weight, like uh, vitamins and everything. So uh, it's beneficial always to be young and healthy uh, and we should try to do it as a part of the medical community. We should not focus only on the mouth, but we should uh, uh, try to persuade uh, our patient to keep a healthy lifestyle as a whole, not just uh, to brush their teeth and stop smoking, but do it as a whole, because the mouth is a part of the whole body. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that's very valid because in the, you also started in the beginning by saying that uh, we still do the, the same treatment as a long time ago, but we have more sophisticated instruments. Of course, we have the, the antibiotics, but we also have these lifestyle factors, the smoking, stress, etc., where we which we should indeed address with the patients, I guess. I have another question for you. Um, somebody says, do you practice occlusal intervention as part of the non-surgical periodontal therapy? So this is a very, very big debate between yeah. us and the prosthodontics, <laughs> and uh, we will not go into it. No. But I'm, uh, but I'm. It's very complicated, as we say. But uh, uh, I personally do not. Uh, do not uh, use any kind of occlusal adjustments in my treatment. Uh, this is not my vision. I'm a, uh, I believe in periodontal treatment and uh, I do not, uh, do not uh, intervene with the occlusion. Okay. Um, it's always an interesting question, this one. I, I agree. I, I have another yes. question here. What is your opinion on Strauman indicating the use of m gain for non-surgical therapy, so flapless use of non-surgical on interbone. Yeah. What do you think? Okay, so uh, um, the data now is coming from only one research. I know that there is a very big multi-center research that is going on in Europe, but we don't have uh, uh, its results yet. Um, um, the research is a, a small amount of patients, only 38 or 39 patients, and uh, it has promising results uh, and in a very, very specific protocol. So uh, the first uh, uh, research is very promising and we must wait for uh, the multi-center result in order to decide whether it is useful to use uh, uh, in the in the phase of the non-surgical periodontal treatment and, and if it will be beneficial so it it's another option to to consider when we treat uh, a patient at this stage okay um i have here another question how do you know how much force to use when you are using curettes subgingivally to remove calculus to in to avoid injuries of patients soft tissues yeah Okay. So I think uh, you should not uh, use that much force and you should combine the ultrasonic uh, with uh, the curette. So if uh, you're feeling it's too hard to take it with hand in instruments, so it's better to use uh, the ultrasonic with a thin tip or maybe a periodontal burr uh, and not to, uh, to put too much force uh, uh, into this uh, action. Yeah, I have another question. I don't know if you do it like this, but there is a question. Is there a minimal plaque score that the patient has to demonstrate before commencing non-surgical periodontal therapy? I don't know if you start first with your um, uh, plaque control and then start your initial therapy or what do you do? We always start with plaque control, but I think uh, uh, that part of the 
part of it is the black control is part of the non-surgical periodontal treatment. It's not a separate phase because if a person has a lot of calculus and uh, uh, so it's very hard to maintain a good oral hygiene. So you have to combine it. You have to to have a, a, the oral hygiene instruction in the first appointment and then to repeat it over and over and over and to see uh, the improvement over the appointment. It is very crucial before you decide to do surgery that he will have a very uh, low uh, uh, plaque uh, indices. But uh, at this stage, yeah, on the contrary, you take people that have no plaque control or very bad plaque control and you make them uh, excel in their oral hyg hygiene habits. Yes. Okay, I have one last question. For how long do you wait before you decide that you can go for surgery after your non-surgical treatment? So the minimal time is uh, eight weeks, uh, but uh, this is the minimal time when we can probe and uh, start to decide uh, what we are doing next. Um, but uh, we can also consider to wait a little bit longer and also and, uh, and to see how things uh, develop. I know that there are clinicians that wait uh, four to six months uh, before they decide, but uh, the minimal time is eight eight weeks. Okay, so thank you so much, um, Orly, for your excellent presentation. And of course, also uh, for all the attendees, um, for the questions. There were really a lot of questions uh, this time. The <laughs> next webinar, yeah, that's good. That's good. It's an interesting topic always, especially the antibiotics, of course. Um, yeah. The next webinar will be uh, in two weeks. Xavier uh, already mentioned it, and then it will be at uh, 1900, so 7 uh, uh, p.m. And two hours later uh, than today, because slowly we're starting to go to our offices uh, again. And the presenter will be Moshe Goldstein and the moderator will be Darko Bozik. And the topic is soft tissue management for immediate post-extraction implants placement. Um, of course, we all wish you to stay safe and uh, to be healthy, of course. Remember that the 12th of May is the original date for the Gum Health Day, which will be a little bit different, of course, uh, this year. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for joining us today and uh, see you in two weeks. And of course, please follow the EFB on social media. Thank you for attending and have a nice evening.